Uh, just to give you an example, even today, most of the roles in the organizations, in our organization, we don't have job descriptions. Mm -hmm. We have what is the purpose of that role, what are the deliverables for the role, mm -hmm. but no job descriptions because we feel that job descriptions are often constraining. And if you, if one has to, in our business, if one has to follow a job description, often that this that would not lead to the right outcome. So we have, we don't have as a policy job descriptions for most of the roles that we have in the organization as, 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 uh, and especially the critical roles. So uh, technology at one instance has helped to uh, remove and allow HR folks in the front line to spend th their efforts in, their, in the places where they get the maximum bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. it, is, it has provided for the right kind of experience to mm -hmm. our employees. And third is uh, insights, providing us with the right insights to, for us to take decisions. How do we use data through which comes up through technology to take the, take the right kind of insights? Hello and welcome to this brand new episode of our special interview series, HR Revolution Perspectives 2023 Experts Take, presented by People Matters in association with Darwin Box. I'm your host, Pallavi. Through this exclusive series, we will delve into conversations with top CHROs and thinking minds from the people and work landscape across Asia. The series builds on insights from the HR Revolution Perspectives 2023 Empower and Evolve Research Study, which is one of the largest workplace transformation studies in Asia. In today's episode, we have with us a Joy V. Post, Managing Director and Group CHRO Olam International. Joy V. joined Olam in 2003, establishing the human resources function. Function has played a key role in the expansion of Olam from a privately held company with 2,500 employees to a publicly listed company with more than 40,000 employees. Prior to joining Olam, his experience has been in the chemical and technology industries, operating in more than 60 countries. And with this diverse team, Joyly believes a culture that embeds inclusion and diversity will be the key factor in the success of future organizations. To navigate this conversation, we are being joined by Vikram Khanna, Global Head, Value Management Advisory and Solutions, Darwin Box. Through his professional journey spanning a decade, Vikram has multi-geographic experience spanning global and regional transformation, industry development and change management, and has worked across roles spanning business development, program management, and solution development. Vikram is passionate about topics like the future of work, macro talent development, change as a critical capability, and the convergence of talent and technology. Thank you so much, Jordi and Vikran, for taking the time to be part of this series and agreeing to share your learnings with us. Thanks, Pallavi. Well, Thanks, as sir. I now hand over to Vikran, it would be wonderful if you can give us a little context of the HR Revolution Perspectives 2023 Empower and Empower Research Study and what it reflects about the trends that are shaping the talent landscape, uh, which will then be followed by a conversation between you and Jordi. So we are looking forward to an insightful discussion. With this, I hand it over to you, Vikram. Thank you so much, Pallavi. Uh, Joydeep, it's a pleasure to have you for this conversation. I've been an admirer of how Olam has grown and uh, have been an avid follower of, of you as well. Uh, really appreciate you making time for this conversation. Uh, HR Perspectives 2023 is uh, a massive undertaking by Darwin Box and People Matters to address a void which exists within the corridor of the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and India, if one thinks of it, where organizations are experiencing rapid growth, they have talent constraints, and technology is acting as a very big catalyst for them to scale programs, for them to right productivity and the right kind of talent management so that they can continue on their growth trajectory. In our first edition, Joydeep, the study saw participation from about 1,200 organizations, cumulatively representing, I, I think if we think of the employment size, which is reflected by the participants, it's almost close to the population of Singapore and the revenue size equal the GDP of Japan. Our intent of doing this study was to go deeper into how is the narrative of HR transformation changing for this market. This is a market that Darwin Box serves uh, and is a key focus for Darwin Box. And People Matters 
as such was the perfect partner because if we think of the community that people matters has built uh, that community primarily is from the markets which are represented in our study uh, are these findings relatable to global trends i would say a lot of them are perhaps the growth story not so much because if one looks at the global landscape we continue to see some mixed sentiments around growth uh, nevertheless as the first uh, edition it's already the largest of its kind if one looks at it from an asia pacific research lens and through this conversation joydeep we are furthering the research and living up to the name which we coined for this initiative which is perspectives to have perspectives of chros from leading organizations such as you uh, once again thank you for making time for this conversation to open up uh, joydeep olam is a very well known name uh, within the region and globally one of the the canvas on which the study is anchored is that if one thinks of the leadership in organizations if one thinks of the cxos there is a very strong intent of growth uh, we found that close to about 80% of our participants are looking at growing across their revenues profitability uh, and if one scratches the surface there are multiple strategies at play over here there are strategies where organizations are 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 going to pivot around uh, inorganic expansion and there are strategies where you're sweating out assets or investments which you've already made through better operational efficiencies in this backdrop particularly of interest was also the fact that investments when it comes to esg will continue to rise so if if one looks at this finding and puts in your views on on how olam is experiencing it joydeep what are some of the trends that you are seeing when it comes to growth and the the ask uh, the changing drivers which it is leading for hr uh vikran first uh, thank you for having me having me here and uh, i'm i'm very pleased to contribute to the body of knowledge uh, and the talent and human capital areas so thank thank you very much uh vikran that was a, a a very complex question that you asked me so uh i'm not sure if uh, trying to respond to it in a few minutes would do justice but let me attempt it and let me attempt it from olam's perspective our perspective as 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 you as as you asked um so first olam uh, we are uh, as of last year we are uh, in terms of a size uh, we are a 55 billion sing dollar company our revenues are at 55 billion sing dollars which should be approximately 42 billion us uh for the region that you did your study perhaps a third of our business comes from this region uh most of our businesses uh, a third would be from americas and europe another third would be from uh from africa and south america so approximately a third as i mentioned would be from this region the region that you did your study and the region in question uh every business and and this is uh, not just olam but uh, every business if you are in a business your aim is to grow and grow profitably growing it's not at the cost of profitably but you would want to be profitable and you would want to grow and this is what you owe to your shareholders because you have to grow profitably while every every business is keen on growing profitably when you look at history there's there's a whole graveyard of companies who have been unable to do so so mm -hmm. when we are questioning and asking people whether they wish to grow you'll obviously hear people wanting to grow mm -hmm. and growing profitably but not many people not many businesses are successful at doing that on a consistent and a sustainable basis so clearly there are there are businesses of course who have been able to do it consistently over years and there is a magic that they have a portion that they have figured out which enables them to do so uh so that's just a a, a view on uh businesses uh, their their aspiration and to what ex extent those aspirations actually uh, get uh, executed on mm. uh, which which uh, which as you know as uh, people in the industry as shareholders not all businesses are successful so what makes 
what what are those uh, what are those factors that make help a business to be successful and in and in this region what are the trends that we see it uh if I, if I look at olam and across our 55 billion dollar of revenues uh we are primarily into areas of food food ingredients and agri commodities so these mm-hmm. these are the broad areas that we are in and this 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 piece that we are this part of the business that we are in is subject to a huge amount of volatility we do see volatility in every business but particularly we believe in the food and agri business volatility is even far more exas- exaggerated because of climate factors climate impacts us directly and mm-hmm. and with the uh, climate change happening there's a, there's a lot of additional volatility that comes into our space far beyond what uh, most businesses uh, deal with mm-hmm. uh and and for us uh, uh a key part of being able to manage this volatility is the kind of leadership we have the kind of talent that we have and a large part of uh, that talent uh, that that is required is comes from experience so we have to build our own talent pipeline so that it has a requisite experience mm-hmm. and insights that they gather from their experience to deal with the volatility so for us it's incumbent on us for us to be successful on a sustainable basis we need to have a, a deep pipeline of talent who have seen our business have grown within our business and have been through some of these crucible experiences and know uh, how to deal with them uh, on a, on a contingent basis so that that becomes very critical for us uh, so so if there are other areas in this that you would want to dwell further uh, mm-hmm. please please uh, 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 you can go forward on them and i'll try to respond to them sure jyoti and in fact you know you you know from that i'll i'll pick on what you said that everyone wants to grow profitably uh, but not everyone grows profitably so if we scratch the surface of this intention to growth what we found in our research was that it's exposing a few key talent risks which organizations face and one of them you alluded to which is you know do we have the right capability for the critical roles which we need for executing on our strategies are we having a very solid leadership pipeline who can drive the business and navigate it through changes and the other lens which was also coming through was the fact that if one looks at the environment today environment is changing uh, and those ecosystem changes impact the ways in which organizations respond for some it could be you know a far more rapid adoption of digital for some it could be you know hedging against the volatility which you know your business faces um, on a on a day to day basis and or it could be a combination of both you alluded to the fact that you have to really focus on the internal talent pipeline and you know if i can if i look at what i read about olam what i read about the culture at olam i think entrepreneurship is one of the one of the bedrocks of how the organization has grown can you tell us a bit more about how are you succeeding in empowering your uh, your managers your leaders to really harness that entrepreneurial mindset and how do you maintain that consistently over the years as olam grows from strength to strength right i i, I think you've touched on a uh, a very important uh, topic for us here in, in at olam um we have grown over the last 30 years from a startup to where we are uh, at over 50 billion dollars in revenue we have more than 40000 employees across the organization and they're spread across more than 60 countries uh, as we speak for us to manage the scale it couldn't have been done uh, just around uh, a structure a, a theoretical organization structure and and through oversights from that structure the only way we could have grown to the scale is when we had leaders who acted as entrepreneurs for their businesses and their functions and and they 
literally owned their business. So they did what was right for the business instead of waiting for decisions to filter down from the top. Mm -hmm. So it was absolutely essential for us to have those kind of leaders in key and those in those key and critical roles who acted who understood the business who acted as owners and took the right decisions on their own and and were empowered to do so so right from the beginning we created a structure where individuals had could take those kind of decisions and then were empowered and were allowed to take those decisions uh, just to give you an example even today most of the roles in the organizations, in our organization, we don't have job descriptions. Mm -hmm. We have what is the purpose of that role, what are the deliverables for the role, mm -hmm. but no job descriptions because we feel that job descriptions are often constraining. And if you, if one has to, in our business, if one has to follow a job description, often that this that would not lead to the right outcome. So we have, we don't have as a policy job descriptions for most of the roles that we have in the organization, as, 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 uh, and especially the critical roles. So coming back to what has helped us to uh, create and sharpen this entrepreneurial culture, one is uh, the way we have structured our organization, the way we have uh, rewarded our uh, team members. So right, uh, right from the initial uh, stages of uh, creating our organization, we have allowed ownership with most of our employees mm -hmm. uh, where they own shares. Even before we went public, we had uh, we and critical managers owning parts of the company. Uh, we have uh, a, re a reward system has uh, for many years in the past looked at uh, matrices that captured entrepreneurial abilities, which was in terms of growth, in terms of uh, new business, new, new business in terms of return measures on capital utilized and on risk capital utilized. So we would assign risk capital to critical business heads so that they could deliver on that risk capital. And, and they were rewarded basis how much they delivered on the risk capital. So uh, it's through a combination of uh, expectations, combination of rewarding the right individuals, and also, the other thing that I've not touched on is our attitude towards failure. Mm. We have been through our quota of failures. I mean, you have to, as, as, as an organization uh, which has sustained itself over years, we do have a quota of failures. It's how do we react to those failures? We have gone through instances where individuals, because of decisions that they have taken, they've incurred significant losses for the company, significant losses. Uh, Whereas uh, in many other organizations, uh, they they may not would have, they would not have continued in their roles for us. We believe that if they have got us into that problem, the kind of learning they would have had in that process would be best utilized if they were entrusted with the responsibility of uh, solving that problem. So we continued with them and we supported them and had them address and get us out of the problem also. And, mm -hmm. and many of our larger uh, failures, we've had the same manager, the same leader, the same team that were entrusted with that uh, initiative to continue and use those learnings to, to solve and address the problem too. So our whole attitude to failures has also helped us in our entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when, when an entrepreneurial company, if it remains too entrepreneurial, it can also can be dysfunctional because entrepreneurship, the, the, the common image that comes to one's mind is opening and starting new businesses. That's a sexy part of entrepreneurship. Mm. But businesses to be successful, as we said earlier, we should be able to scale them up and scale them up profitably. So that is also for us a part of entrepreneurship. It is not just about starting a new business, how many new revenue sources that you could come up with, but also have you been as a leader, been able to scale up businesses and scale, like scaling up businesses is actually getting into, uh, getting into the, the brick and mortar work of building an institution, getting the right culture in, getting the right talent in, setting uh, up the, the right kind of processes and practices in the organization and being process oriented. Mm -hmm. So often 
the two uh, the two blocks of being entrepreneurial and being process oriented often don't go hand in hand for us it is also about if you have to scale a business forward you have to put in the right processes and ensure that those processes work without building in bureaucracy with and at the same time retaining the the founders mindset so as a founder we retain the founders mindset which is how do we continue to uh to to build new businesses and grow at the same time that's interesting so, yeah so these so, are opposites that you have that we have to hold together and and create the organization that is able to deal with these two opposites and build that capability of 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 uh, supporting them that's interesting right because one would typically think that it's a dichotomy when it comes to entrepreneurship and processes but the way you articulated how the both go hand in hand at ola i'm uh, i'm sure you know i've taken a special note of it to quote elsewhere uh, the other thing which i took away was the attitude to failure uh, and again if one resonates with if if i try to resonate it across the uh, across my my professional career as a consultant as as now someone who is in a tech firm driving a, a global team it it again kind of resonates very well because it puts in the notion on that you are trusting your employees to number one take those risks and then secondly should things go wrong they need to they need to feel the comfort that you know they they have continued to be trusted for getting the organization out of that soup or uh, alternatively thinking of a solution to averse any future risk that learning becomes really important now joydi it's great to hear about the story of entrepreneurship and the consistency with which it is maintained uh, as you do acquisitions and more and more organizations come under the olam fold how do you you know quickly make those organizations become and start working in the olam way any secret sauce over there yeah i think that's a brilliant question and uh, we've had uh, multiple acquisitions over the years uh and and just as a context uh, our industry the food industry typically grows globally and we are present globally at half the average gdp growth across the world so gdp grows at around 4% so the food industry grows at around 2% the commodity in the food industry grows around 2 to 1/2% mm-hmm. depending on what the growth so it's a it's not a fast growing unlike the tech industry it's not an industry that is growing at an exponential pace but mm-hmm. within this industry we've been growing at 3 to 4 times of the typical growth of this industry so how do you get your growth happening and uh so one as you rightly said it's organic and it's in organ in organic too through acquisitions now when we acquire companies and we have acquired companies with uh, deep legacy they've been there for years together like the first acquisition was an australian cotton company which was a public sector organization then they listed themselves but they still mm-hmm. had the modus operandi of a public sector organization called queensland cotton so I, so and like that we have acquired other organizations along the way but they have grown at very mediocre growth rates and then mm-hmm. we suddenly bring them into our fold and then when they do their planning and then there's a whole expectation setting that happens where uh when in the past they've grown at 2% and then we suddenly tell them that you have to grow at 8 to 10% this mm-hmm. nothing less anything less than that won't be accepted so so there is a shock so we prepare them for the shock and first thing is we retain the same leadership team we have there have rarely been a case where we have changed leaders so the same leadership team continues with that business uh and most of our acquisitions have been on account of scope so acquisitions typically happen either for scope or for scale or a combination of both if it's a combination then it's a very little diffused acquisition you don't know why you're acquiring but typically it's either scale, scale or scope so scale mm-hmm. is where you're trying to reduce the cost of the new business that you are acquiring by integrating it into your organization scope is where you're getting a new set of customers a new set of products a new market that you are entering and that is scope most of our acquisitions have been scope most a few have been scale but most have been scope so when we go in for a scope uh, related acquisition 
we, we allow that company to retain its identity. We do not integrate it or we do not on day one change all the, all the banners and the signages, et cetera. We allow it to retain its identity. We just tell them that we have, now you have another company which will help you to fund your growth, to support your growth. Come back with a growth plan. If you have been growing at 2%, come back with a plan which is three times that. And no constraints. Don't build in any constraints. So we encourage them to do so. So we plant some of our own managers who are from that business into that team. And they allow the team to think without boundaries. If you're working in the, if you're working in this market and these are your strengths, where else can those with those same strengths can you operate? Can you increase your markets further? Can you mm. grow beyond? And that's the way we have encouraged them, the same leadership teams, to think beyond and uh, grow their businesses. I'll give you a specific example. Uh, Queensland Cotton was an acquisition that we did, I think, in 2007, one of the first large acquisitions we did. And they had a small uh, acquired company in the U.S. Until then, we did not have a presence in the U.S. Through this acquisition, we had a very, very small company that was acquired by them earlier, and they had not integrated themselves, which was existing in the U.S. The leader of that team in the U.S. who was leading, and he still continues with the organization, uh, he had a I mean, he, he was running a very small business because by nature, it was a small business in the U.S. So we spoke to him and we found out that he has significant understanding and insights into the ag space in the U.S., the agri agricultural space in the U.S. And we told him that if you have to grow this business multifold, how would you do it? So we said, and, we, and he said, does it have to be within the confines of cotton industry? He said, no, look beyond. So he, mm -hmm. within the next few years, he came back with uh, proposals of acquisitions in other areas. So we acquired a spices company. We acquired, we set up a, a, an almonds uh, company there, and then we acquired orchards and almonds uh, in the almond space. And likewise, we grew U.S. starting from that small base that we had, courtesy him in the initial stages. And today, a third of our revenues come from the U.S., Wow. If we had gone by the traditional route, the way acquisitions happen, we would have said, now you manage your businesses, get us profits from your business, mm -hmm. uh, do whatever, and don't look beyond your business. We would not have had been able to build a base and we would not have got the kind of insights that we could from that team there who mm -hmm. went beyond what their, their mandate was and uh, their portfolio was and helped us to build a solid base in the U.S. today. So it's just an example of how uh, you can drive that uh, entrepreneurial culture even when you are you are pursuing an acquisitive strategy where you're able to integrate your acquisitions into the culture of the company. And those very people, many, most of those leaders have continued and, and uh, they have actually uh, thrived in this organization. Today, they are better entrepreneurs than many of the older people in this or the people mm -hmm. who have been in this organization for longer periods of time. So, so I'm of the firm belief that um, people do change, even if they have not, if, even if they have not been accustomed to that environment when you bring in, bring them in and, and they see that it's in their best interest, their individual interests and the interests of their organization, they do change with the right kind of support. Hmm. It's interesting, you know, while we are talking about business, I'll try to relate it with the study and how the narrative for transformation seems to be changing. So if, if one looks at the old ways of how acquisitions were done, you know, you acquire or even right now you acquire and, and then you say that, okay, now uh, you have your business, get me profits, which is, you know, doing acquisitions for just that piece for which you've gone ahead and put in money. Uh, and if if one contrasts it with what you're saying, it's about, you know, setting growth expectations and not letting them have constraints so that they also start thinking like an entrepreneur. It's interesting because on that same narrative, if one thinks of how expectations from HR and expectations from transformation journeys in HR are changing, it's moving away from that inside view of, you know, making HR more efficient, looking at cost reductions in HR to actually going ahead and empowering the businesses, driving employee experience, 
becoming that force of change within the organization. So I can only, uh, I, I can, I can perhaps only imagine a fraction of how the HR function at Olam navigates through these complexities. So if if one now puts a lens on HR, Joydi, how does the function reflect those same entrepreneurial spirits, process adherence, and at the same time, you know, bears that mantle of building this culture consistently? What has what have been some of your learnings and successes there? Interesting question, uh, Vikrant. Um, so I think right from the very first day in this organization, I was the first HR manager to join. And then subsequently, there's another colleague of mine, Shiram, who joined. And both of us were the first two managers to set up the HR function. Uh, the philosophy has been that uh, the line managers, the operating managers are the HR managers. Their job is HR. And professional HR team members who are a part of the HR function, they are there to enable and support them so that they can be the true HR managers. So that's been the philosophy of the organization right from day one. And this is a philosophy that uh, a founder CEO also firmly believes in, saying that uh, if the line managers, operating managers are accountable for their functions and businesses, they have to take accountability for their mm -hmm. people and for their uh, human capital. Mm. And HR will enable them, will create the right environment for them, provide them with the tools, but they have to deliver. And in being consistent with that philosophy, we have ensured that we've always have had a very, very lean HR function. Even today, we are probably one of the leanest for the 40,000 employees. We have not more than 250 or 260 HR team members across. Mm -hmm. So we still continue to be a very, very lean function. And we we that leanness itself, we see it as a factor that is able to deliver on our promise from HR. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that and then HR is is involved in driving uh, the 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 vision around human capital also along with the line managers what direction that it has to go. So that is one principle. Uh, the the second principle that uh, has been that uh, for every dollar invested, whether through effort or uh, through a through a regular investment, we have tried. Uh, uh, figuring out what is a value that is coming out of it. So we mm. have been very value focused. As an organization, we've been value focused and that has also crept into HR that 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 for all the effort, for all the time that we spent, what is a value that is being perceived is, is being perceived by uh, our uh, aligned managers and, and the rest of the organization. And, mm. and that focus on value has helped us to Cut, get out of the stuff that is non-value adding immediately. And, mm -hmm. and instead of simplifying things, simplifying policies, as I mentioned, I mean, that's just an example. We uh, never had a job description. We felt that the effort required in a job description wasn't worth uh, that job description. So mm -hmm. we never had it. So similarly, many of our policies today are not documented. It's mm -hmm. a lot to do with your common sense. And use your common sense. If you if you were to do it the way you would want it, use your common sense and and go about it. So the, we have very little documented policies. We're now getting into some documented policies, but right from the beginning, we really didn't have too many documented policies. Mm -hmm. So whatever was uh, for the limited resources we had, we ensured that we were getting the best outcomes from those resources. So mm -hmm. we had to consciously uh, decide on transactions that we would not get involved in, that we will not do, even if that may come at a cost. If you don't do, so be it, because our resources can be better utilized elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we actively uh, got out of such work, which uh, we felt was not truly adding value. So this, this part of seeing where is value getting added and how we can contribute to that value add has been another key philosophy of ours right from the beginning, right from day one. Uh, the third thing is that... Uh, this company has been founded by employees. A CEO founded this company co as a co-founder. He's an employee. He's a professional employee. So we have always uh, been uh, an employee-centric organization. Mm -hmm. uh, tough decisions on employees 
we have not taken them easily. We do a lot of circumspection before we take a decision which can be tough on employees. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a decision around compensation, a decision even when, when we have had downturns, we have rarely succumbed to uh, severances and and and, and uh, layoffs. We typically don't do that. We have done it, not that we have not done it, but it comes at with a lot of circumspection. So we have been an employee centric organization before. When we take decisions which impact employees, the uh, the trend is to discuss those decisions with those employees that are being impacted and then take a call, not an arbitrary call which comes suddenly when people don't know about it. So these are often discussed and 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 people are aware of it when, when a decision of this nature is taken. So we've been an employee-centric, and even though today we operate in, in, in geographies where uh, this is not the norm, typically uh, in, in the Western cultures where decisions are more taken yeah. more arbitrarily, more uh, with a more sharper way, we are different. We don't do it in that manner. We take our time before we take these kind of decisions that impact people negatively. When mm -hmm. we want to transfer someone to another place, it's a discussed, this as an example, if if it's discussed with the individual, discussed with the uh, family, and then and then and then the time timelines are also uh, agreed on that manner so that it can, and then that uh, all of these discussions happen, decisions happen through discussions. So that's the nature of the, and that has helped uh, the organization retaining its employees. Our attrition is one of is very low. It's one of the lowest, probably uh, among similar similar companies and industries. Uh, so I don't know if I've touched on what you had asked, yeah. but I would say these are the three key things that have helped us to navigate uh, from where from the day we started to where we are. No, I think you've touched on it. Uh... You not only touched on it, I think each and every one of those three elements which you spoke of uh, are very meaningful. And, you know, I'm sure we can have a conversation on each one of them for a day, if not more, on, on how you drive it. Uh, the one which I found uh, of, of relevance and, you know, of, uh, of personal attachment, you know, I've been a consultant. I've spent a lot of time helping organizations drive their HR transformation. The, the fact that the manager is the HR is such a difficult change to drive in any uh, large-scale transformation or organization change, if you think of it. And to have that already in place, I think it's, it's, it's a big uh, force multiplier in many ways because you can't have HR everywhere. And, and you know, the fact that you run such an efficient team uh, again, speaks to it on how this combination of almost saying that everyone is HR. If you're if you're a manager, you're also responsible for people. It's it's a very powerful thought to uh, to take forward. Uh, Joydeep, I'm also cautious of time. Uh, I'll I'll just want to touch upon one more question. Right, uh, as you scale, and you know, if we combine everything that we spoke of, you know, there is there are acquisitions which happen. There's the entrepreneurial mindset. There's the embedding of process. There is a value-driven HR organization which rests. You know, what our study was also pointing towards was that organizations who are complementing all of this well with a thought-through technology strategy in HR kind of create a very strong binding force where, you know, on one side, it gives, it, it, it gives the ability for HR to scale fast, to tailor programs fast. And on the other side, if one thinks of employee centricity, which is also one of the central pivots for your HR organization, it sort of bakes in that view that at all points in time, employees feel that they have the right kind of support. They have transparency. They have access. Managers are invested. So, you know, if, if one thinks of that glue, uh, that role of a glue which technology plays. How is that shaping up at Olam? What are your thoughts over there? Yeah, uh, a very, very pertinent uh, question there. So uh, it is the backbone. Technology is the backbone. And uh, let me support that uh, through a couple of uh, uh, factors. Uh, so one, if HR has to be remain lean, there are transactions. You know, we can't just say that 
those transactions are not important. When a person is from joining till the person uh, comes on board, onboarding gets completed to uh, uh, KRAs and KPIs being assigned, reviews happening on time, uh, then performance management happening, exercise happening, the compensation exercise is happening, learning and development. So there are transactions, multiple transactions that are happening at each stage. How do we simplify that? For which there are two drivers. One is a shared services. So we have a shared services um, in out of India and in HR shared services. Mm -hmm. And HR shared services, uh, they take up a huge load of from frontline HR. And then they drive technology also. So there's there's a lot of technology at use today, uh, which uh, which which help in making this whole process seem seamless, and also providing the right kind of experience to mm -hmm. uh, to to our employees. So how do we provide the right kind of experience? So um, so today we have uh, the bots as usual, where where uh, any query you can send the query out to the bot, the bot responds immediately, and people have got used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our automated uh, surveys that come out at, at different lifestyle events, milestone events in an individual's life in the organization. The surveys uh, then go and populate a dashboard. And then so that's also part of it. So uh, technology at one instance has helped to uh, remove and allow HR folks in the front line to spend uh, their uh, th their efforts and their and the places where they get the maximum bang for the buck. Mm. It is a, it has provided for the right kind of experience to mm. our employees. And third is uh, insights, providing us with the right insights to for us to take decisions. How do mm. we use data through which comes up through technology to take the take the right kind of insights? So uh, so so that is very so our attrition data, uh, our dashboards. Uh, our uh, analytics that we do, which uh, sources of analytics are everyday data that gets generated from attendance, from other sources, plus our engagement surveys that we keep doing, the pulse surveys that we keep doing, uh, the employee reactions that come in, learning data that comes in. So we have a team that looks at all this data and comes up with insights which help us to take decisions uh, at, at, at various points. Mm -hmm. So uh, technology is a backbone uh, shared services is another area where they bring that expertise to deal with uh, all these transactions in the right manner and the, and the analytics team that helps us to uh, come up with insights that lead to better decisions being taken. I understand. No, I think, uh, again, very well put because you're also thinking of having the right foundation in place so that, you know, HR has the time to focus on working very closely with businesses for the size, yeah. for the scale, or for experience. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's very well put. And I think, you know, one of the few conversations where, where I've seen someone also stress on the importance of having shared services, because classically, if you think of that HR services role, you can eliminate the process handoffs, which typically happen in that absence, and really have a frictionless view to how employees are experiencing their journey at Olam. So it was very interesting to hear your thoughts. Almost on time, Joydi. Uh, for closing thoughts, I know you've been a huge, uh, you speak very passionately about how organizations will grow on the back of inclusivity, how organizations will grow on the back of embracing, grow on the back of embracing diversity. Uh, any closing thoughts for our viewers? Uh, you've of course been through the research you can talk about that. You can talk about, uh, you know, your uh, your views on HR at Ulan and how things will change over the coming one to two years. Uh, closing remarks, Joel. I think the field that we are in, uh, human capital, uh, it's it's a field where we are learning every day, and if we believe that uh, what we know and what we have experienced is sufficient to deliver on the expectations of the future, we would be fooling ourselves. So for mm. us, uh, professionals who are showing the path in the human capital area, for us, we the burden on us to keep learning every day and keeping us uh, completely aware of the changes that are happening is, is absolutely essential. 
So uh, I think the, the, the burden of learning, the burden of change is far higher in our area than even in, in some of the tech areas that is happening that, that, that we believe is, is happening at a faster pace. So uh, I think that's the learning and the insight that I have. And uh, I, would, I would end with that actually. That is profound, right? Learning every day is, and 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 the way you put it on the human capital space is also very interesting. Uh, it's been an area I've also given twenty years of my life to, so resonate completely. Pallavi, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jordi and Vikrant, for sharing those learnings and those insights with us. And for everyone who's watching this interview, thank you for tuning in. And if you've not yet got your copy of the HR Review from Perspectives 2023 Empower and Evolve edition of the study, then you can just click on the link provided below this interview and download the copy now. If you want more details on how to automate day-to-day -day HR processes, uh, steps to simplify human interactions and getting actionable insights to build better workplaces, you can simply visit www.darwinbox.com. That's all in today's episode. Stay tuned as HR Evolution Perspectives 2023 Expert Tech brings you another insightful dis discussion where we break down the important talent trends across India and APAC and deliberate solutions with the top talent leaders. Thank you so much and have a good day. 